uh, just welcome to those new members of committee that are joining us. Um, as you're all aware, we became a committee of the whole uh, at our last council meeting. So welcome to those uh, councillors joining us on the committee. And I'll get Tracy to start with the Karakia. Thanks, Tracy. Good a walk, Warren, and morning, councillors. Um, so let's start. Here we go. Fakataka taho kiti uru, Fakataka taho kiti tonga, Kia makina kina kiuta, Kia matara tara kitai, Ihiaki ana tiata kura, Itil, he hooker, Iho hu. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we have quite a big agenda in front of us today. We've got six uh, items for decision and another three for information and then a publicly excluded one. So um, I'm not going to have a guess at the time, but hopefully we will uh, transition through the agenda uh, in a relatively smooth manner. Um, apologies. We have an apology for Councillor Downard for absence. Uh, early departure, no lateness. Um, are there any other apologies? I do notice we have a couple of councillors missing. Okay, I'll move those apologies be accepted. Seconder, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hodge, all those in favour? Opposed, so carried. Now move on to the confirmation of the agenda. Um, just one of the items with the agenda, obviously um, the list of councillors attending on the front is now incorrect since we've extended to a committee of the whole. Uh, so just noting that, um, I can have a mover and a seconder for the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Clarkson and Councillor Hughes. All those in favour? Opposed? So carried. Yes, by all means. Through you, Mr Chair, councillors, we, uh, James has just handed out an additional uh, piece of information. This is a, this is really just to assist you in respect of item number nine, which is council submission to its uh, own coastal plan. I uh, will talk through the submission when we get there. This is really just to help you uh, see where some of the change, what some of the changes will look like. So. It's not new information, it's really just for clarity's sake. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, moving on to disclosures of interest. Are there any that relate to any of the matters that we will be discussing that are new for councillors? Take that as no, thank you very much. So we'll move on to the first item, uh, which is item five and which is page six in your agenda. And that's the submission for helping nature and people to thrive exploring biodiversity credit scheme for New Zealand. Well, through you, Mr. Chair, before uh, Judy gets started on this, just reminding councillors that uh, we foreshadowed this piece of um, submission work that the team were doing at our last committee, noting that at that stage we had only uh, very had very early receipt of the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity. This was part of the package that uh, came out with the announcement. So uh, Judy and the team have been working on, on the submission, noting it's part of our um, biodiversity response. You put uh, your speaker on, Judy, and pull it up close as always. Okay, now. Might want to be a little bit closer, Asha Judy, thanks. Thank you, Mr Chair, councillors, uh, Tena Koto Katoa, ko Judy Van Rossum Toko Ingoa. So uh, my name's Judy Van Rossum and I'm Specialist Policy Advisor in the Policy Implementation Team. Uh, so this report presents council's proposed submission on the government's discussion document, um, helping nature and people thrive, exploring a biodiversity credit system for Aotearoa New Zealand. So as Tracy alluded to, this was uh, released alongside the Gazette of the NPSIB in July. It's, the discussion document is very much an initial engagement to start the conversation and does not set out the specifics around a proposed biodiversity credit system in New Zealand. 
Rather, they're seeking feedback on the need for and the design of such a system and the roles of government, Māori and others in implementing it. So just by way of background, by purchasing credits, people and organisations can finance and claim credit for their contribution to nature positive actions and outcomes. So therefore, the development of such a system is intended to increase funding opportunities from the private sector towards restoration efforts. As it's widely recognised that current private and public investment is falling short of what is needed to protect our threatened species and habitats. It's quite challenging to design an effective and efficient credit system. The primary risks of creating a public market for biodiversity credits are around the design, the longevity and the credibility of any market, and also the risk of perverse outcomes. So consideration needs to be given to what's actually being sold, who can purchase those credits that are generated, and how these are measurable and auditable. So our submission's cautiously supportive of the concept and intent of a biodiversity credit system. Uh, some of the key points are as follows. So we suggest that priority is given to protecting existing biodiversity and investment in high ecological value areas and threatened species. And also activities and outcomes that yield multiple outcomes that include, for example, including benefits to soil, climate change, mitigation and water quality. So kind of getting the best bang for your buck. We advocate a high level of government oversight and involvement, at least in the initial stages, to ensure that the system has integrity and to guard against gaming of the system. We also recommend that biodiversity credits and offsets should remain separate, with credits aimed at positive outcomes for biodiversity rather than offsetting development-related biodiversity loss, which is a regulatory tool for resource management. The submission also emphasises the importance of ensuring that a biodiversity credit system respects Māori rights, involves Māori in its creation, and recognises the cultural significance of land and biodiversity to Māori. And lastly, in terms of the links to carbon credits, the submission suggests that the biodiversity credit scheme should focus on biodiversity outcomes primarily. The carbon credit system and the ETS need to mature, needs to mature and impending changes worked through before a new biodiversity credit system is linked to it. So that's the end of my introduction and I'm happy to answer questions. I also have uh, Blair Keenan, our resource economist, is, has also assisted on the submission so I can answer any of those related questions. Thank you, Judy. I'll come to councillors for questions. Councillor Graff. Yeah, so hi, Judy. Hi. International investment, that kind of thing, is this what could happen? It's privatisation of the um, of the estate, would you think? So there is a question, the, the submission responds to a bunch of consultation questions in the discussion document, and one of them is around international investment. And we have um, very cautiously suggested that, yes, that could be explored, but we need to be mindful that our biodiversity is very unique and that international um, investment needs to be very carefully considered in that context. And with the new government, do you think there'll be a, um, a withdrawal from this idea? Is this like a social system? Is it, is it, for example, I pay the system a million bucks and they leave me alone kind of thing? Or, you know, how does it work? Okay, maybe if I could just direct that question through the chair to Blair Keenan, is that? More than happy, yeah. Thank you, Blair. Be on here. Um, <clears throat> the, I mean, the way it works is, is intended to be, there's, there's no change of ownership. It's like a payment for services. Um, if you want to, um, you know, if you're running a company that um, you think you'd get a marketing advantage from um, supporting biodiversity outcomes, then you purchase these credits and it gives you a, an opportunity to say that you're, you're doing that. So I don't think there's any intention for there to be any change of ownership 
of the conservation estate or anything like that. Um, it's it's a much more um, kind of akin to a purchase of services. Is it big scale or small scale? Is it, for example, a little private guy with his farm or the bush block? Is it more targeted at that? I think those are design questions that are still to come. So this is kind of, in principle, is it a good idea? Mm. Um, and and there's still a lot of work before those kinds of details are. And there's there's another issue, another concern I'd have with this is that, for example, if there were two neighbours, one's right up to date with credit, the other isn't. Was a little bit of confusion and fighting back. I, I don't know. I just. I worry about it a little bit, that's all. So um, I know it's early stages, but. Judy, back to you, Mr Chair, thank you. Thank you, and and along those lines, Judy, can you just outline um, how you see this process going through with the government and, and is there any um, indication from the incoming government that, that this is something that they've indicated would be a policy line as well, please? Yes, so uh, I think if, this is probably something that the national government would be quite supportive of. So this is um, certainly aligned with their general kind of environmental policies. Um, as I said in my introduction, it is very much an exploratory phase. So there hasn't been real real decisions made about the design of the system. So there's, the submissions close this Friday. So the government will consider those submissions. And then um, following that, there will be some uh, sort of proposed sort of design may be put out and then there'll be processes of consultation after that. So I expect that this is going to take some time to work its way through. Thanks, Judy. Um, I've got Noel and then I'll come back to Bruce. Thank you. Uh, I'm generally supportive of this uh, area, but I um, you, you mentioned perverse outcomes. And, and the, when I read the report and just things I'm doing on the farm as well, I'm trying to replant areas of wetland and whatever. Um, I, I'm just concerned that it's a good idea, but it, unless it's managed well, it's open to abuse as well. And, and that, that's the perverse outcomes that I'm concerned about. So absolutely support anything um, to support nature and biodiversity. But I really have some um, concerns about how these systems end up being manipulated. So it's a comment rather than a question. So um, I'm not sure if there is a question in there, but um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Noel. Uh, Bruce. Oh, yeah. Look, th thank you for that report, Judy. I, I think you've, you've hit the um, appropriate level because as you rightfully point out, this is not a definitive proposal that we're responding to. This is just a, you know, how do we feel about this really at this stage? Um, I'm in strongly supportive of the intent here in relation to um, credit, a biodiversity credit. I, I, looking at the document that's been prepared, I just have one sort of slight caution around emphasis. Now, I understand why you have focused on existing biodiversity and highest ecological value areas. But there is a sort of a bit of a disconnect in the text between that and the opportunities that are presented in terms of um, what you might call creating new habitat reconstruction, which is a theme all the way through the national mm. policy statement. And I think we have to be a bit careful about, you know, I accept that we'll, we will give priority to existing biodiversity and highest ecological value areas. But of course, the problem with those still is we don't have total control over outcomes in those areas and in mm -hmm. fact for the future and for the you know the potential of biodiversity on our landscape we have to be thinking about novel ways of addressing the things we can't control and in fact creating new habitat in new places now i'm saying this on behalf of a good number of farmers in our region who actually are doing really good work which is additional to what the legal requirement is, you know, whether it be riparian planting or whatever, they're not just doing the minimum, they're doing additional work. And the point there is what credit can they be given for new creation of habitat versus existing habitat? Because they should be getting credit for both. 
and actually the potential for um, new, new habitat, I think, is enormous in our region. And um, some of you will know the project I'm involved in here in Hamilton, which has now produced the largest area of indigenous dominated habitat from scratch, from nothing. Um, so I just wanted to caution on that and wondered if you could just, before it's submitted, just do a quick run through and make sure there's not that too great an internal cons um, inconsistency because the NPS does call for reconstruction and it calls for creation of new habitat and we want to be sure that in any credit system that people might get appropriate credit for the sort of work they're doing which leads to what you might call the development of new native permanent forest in any shape or form and new um, wetland in any shape or form. So um, corridor development is the obvious one, you know, that's creating new habitat, but it's linking existing high quality habitat, uh, buffering of systems, um, enhancement and reconstruction. All of those elements are contributing to creation of new habitat. So um, um, with that, I, I'll, I'll leave it. And um, yeah, thank you for your work on this on this document. And I'm hopeful and I would comment actually on the question that was made about the incoming government. There is clearly some support in the new government for this for this work and candidate for the closest to our region here, Barbara Kuriger, has expressed strong support for this um, idea, particularly the idea of biodiversity credit for new creation of habitat. Thank you. So I'll just go to Tracy now, who's been writing furiously next to me, and I'm sure has captured your um, comments, Bruce, and just make sure perhaps that we look at um, part B of number two of the motion in front of us and include some more wording around exactly what you've just raised. Uh, but could I just have a comment at one point, please, too? Um, Warren, happy to wait. Thanks. No, no. Uh, I'll, I'll just go to Tracy first, Stu, and then I'll come back to you. Thanks. Oh, good. Thank you, Mr Chair. So, councillors, the matters I picked up for just for us to go back into the submission and double check we've got it right. Um, firstly, Councillor Graff's matter around making sure there's equity and not competition between neighbours. So, nothing, um, nothing that's implemented looks to uh, favour competition. It's around equity. I'm um, picking up Councillor Smith's um, comments around ensuring that we're not creating those perverse outcomes through unintended consequences and making sure that there is that that management, as Judy alluded to in her opening, but just re reinforcing that. Um, and then in regard to Councillor Clarkson's comments around just checking through the submission for that emphasis, not, not in any way diluting the emphasis on existing or highest value um, habitats and areas being a priority, but really uh, seeing where we can insert some opportunities to acknowledge the opportunity of creating new habitats, those reconstructed habitats, and ensuring that the people who are doing it for the right reason are getting appropriate recognition. So picking up those, I guess, are the, the, the four key matters that I captured. That's. You're, you're happy with those summaries that councillors mm -hmm. had that input? OK, we'll, we'll give Stu a second to sit down. <laughs> and uh, and uh, just mindful that uh, Tipper's joined us online too. Good morning, Tipper. Morning. All right, kia ora. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, really supportive of where we're going with this. Um, I've actually done a bit of homework on this over the years. At other times, and it, it does happen all around the world, but um, some of the comments are quite right. There's all sorts of opportunities to manipulate things and, and all that sort of stuff. Eh? Some of the stuff I've read about in South America is pretty average, but and, and I suspect that's part of the reason it's taken us so long to um, get to this point, but really supportive of the submission. Um, also really supportive of the comments Bruce made, and probably only bit I'd add is it always seems to me that a lot of the high quality biodiversity we've got has kind of been by good luck rather than by good management. And to me, that's another reason why we need to be careful um, not to um, just target those areas that are high, high biodiversity, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Stu. Uh, ben. 
Yeah, um, just one question. Um, you indicate that this wouldn't be something that would allow someone to subdivide a section and then buy biodiversity credits in order to uh, allow that to happen. It's it's that would be a development side, whereas this is separate again. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, that's correct. So, um, I mean, there are some uh, district councils in the region that have their biodiversity lot provisions in their district plans, so they would not be able to get biodiversity credits for doing for doing that, that subdivision and, and uh, setting aside a conservation lot, because that would essentially be double counting. Yes, I think um, for you, Mr Chair, um, to respond to Councillor Dunbar-Smith, um, Back when I was at district councils, they were known as the scrubby corner lots um, because there was some questionability as to the ecological importance of some of those in order to get an additional development right. But I think, thankfully, in the last 30 years, we've learned a lot. And what this proposal is, is as um, Judy's outlined, it's not at that level. It's really raising it up and looking about looking at uh, outcomes, I think, and also not not focused on um, what you'd have to do to, to get across statutory hurdles. Thank you, Tracy. Any other questions? So the motion before us is in uh, one and two, and basically that is that the report uh, is received and then that the council delegates uh, to myself and Tracy uh, to make sure that the uh, amendments identified in the written comments and discussion we've had this morning are included. So, yeah, microphone, Claude. Um, I support the uh, receiving of the report. I don't support the submission. So can we separate the two? Is that what you're getting to? Just I was going to do them at, at one, but if you want to break it, if we can yeah, we can break it down into parts. Thanks. No. The, the question to me is, are we actually saying that we approve the submission because it's approval to lodge the submission? Is that an inference that we're approving the submission? Or should we be saying that we approve the submission and approve and delegate to you two to sign it off? It's a, I'm being pedantic, but and I know what's intended, but I think that may be picked up in the subject to amendments identified in written comments and discussion head. What's the bottom there? Are, are, are we actually approving the submission? We're actually approving the lodgement of it, but we're not actually approving the submission. Oh, I, I, so that's what I'm being pedantic about. Yeah. Through, through you, Mr Chair, this is our standard phrasing that we've used. So if there are words in there that councillors would like to see, this is what we've used for the last four years. Um, if, if there are clarification in there, we'd happily take that on. But this is this is our standard phrase that we've used that we've taken as approval for lodgement. Um, but if we want to to change it, refine it, happy to do that. Again, I just repeat the fact that we're approving the lodgement, but we're not approving the we're actually not approving the submission. We should be approving the submission for lodgement. Um, and again, I'll just move aside. But we are approving the lodgement of the proposed submission. I, I think it's semantics. And I mean, we've re we want to have a bit of um, oversight of, as to what the views of this council are. We're approving the submission. It, that's how I see it. I mean, I've, I've lost count of how many fights we've had in here when staff have run out of time and had to approve submissions quickly, and we haven't had a chance as councillors to go over it. And I'm, that's just the way it was so occasionally. Through no fault of our staffs, um, and we got really upset about it as a council. So we're, we're approving it. Cool. Thank you, Sue. Yep, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. I think we're approving it, subject to amendment. That's yes. what we're doing. Correct. And it's written up there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We'll let that one go, but we will break it down into uh, two pieces. Thanks, James. Uh, so obviously, number one is that uh, we receive the report. So if I could have a mover and a seconder for that piece, and so number one. Uh, so moved, Councillor Smith, seconded myself. All those in favour? Opposed? So carried. And then we have the second part that we lodge the proposed council submission 
subject to the amendments identified today in this discussion and coming back to myself and Tracy. So move Councillor Hodge, seconded Councillor Clarkson. All those in favour? Opposed? All right. So we have Tippo, you were in, in favour? Sorry, just for clarification. Yes, support. Thank you. Support the resolution. And if we could have noted, Councillor Graff. Uh, Council Clarkson. Thank you for that, councillors. We'll now move on to item six, uh, which is on page 25. And this is around our submission to the Select Committee inquiry into community, community sorry, lead managed retreat and adaption. Funding. We have Alejandro joining us down the end there. You will notice he started November off molus, so we'll see how that progresses for the month. And I'm sure he has a Movember page for those who would like to donate, as Alejandro does every year. Um, Mr. Chair, this is a uh, really important piece of work that came out through the Select Committee inquiry into community led managed retreat and adaptation funding. Um, it is a piece of the puzzle that we as a sector and as an organisation have been curious about for some time. Um, we know it is very live not only in our region but throughout the country. Um, Alejandro and the team have put a lot of work into this submission um, talking across the organisation and getting that as we always do getting that um, cross directorate overview um just for councillors uh interest i guess in response to submissions that we lodged earlier in the year and i think it was a, a request from councillor story that we highlight those key summary points and we've done this in all the submissions and you've got to swathe them before you today um just those key points uh those summary points that we will really highlight and in this submission, they're identified in paragraph 13, but Alejandro will take you through the details. Um, thank you, Tracy. Can I please check with people online that they can hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Tenekoto Katoa, um, Heika Tuki Policy Implementation, Ko Alejandro Cifuentes, Toko Ingwa. Thank you, councillors, for the time today. As um, you know, from the agenda, I will be talking to you on the proposed submission on the select committee inquiry into community led managed retreat and adaptation funding. Um, the environment select committee has opened an inquiry on options for community led retreat and adaptation funding. The aim of this uh, inquiry is to explore tools that enable community relocation. So that is moving away from areas at risk from natural hazard and climate change and to look at how the cost of adapting to climate change could be met. Our submission in general is supportive and makes recommendations based on our organizational experience working in collaboration with district councils, EWIT partners and communities in long-term adaptation planning, of which you've heard of as part of the workshops and reports that we brought to this committee. Um, as Tracy mentioned, in the preamble of the submission, so that is pages, uh, 31 to 34 of your agenda pack. Uh, we noted some uh, high level comments on areas of interest that we have. So this is um, specifically on present adaptation challenges, funding mechanisms, tools that we need now to do the work uh, and the impact of this work on existing work programs and capacity that we have based on current work arrangements. And then also a few key recommendations on TTDT based adaptation. Additional to this, we responded to the questions in outlining the issues and options paper, and you can see that table in pages 35 to 48 of your agenda pack. I'm happy to take questions now through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any questions from councillors? Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> uh, Alexandra, yeah, um, page 32. Um, Happy with the submission, just concerned that the whole consultation document doesn't provide any concrete solutions to questions of who should pay or 
uh, how, what, and when. That's the fundamental question of this whole adaption process, and um, they don't seem to be giving any direction. To you, Mr. Chair, that, that is correct. So that's why we've identified that in the submission. Um, however, as um, the process of the Select Committee inquiry is they're inviting uh, broad comments and learnings from different councils. I attended a HUI of the adaptation, the, the Aiken, the Aotearoa Climate Adaptation Network practitioners. And this is one of the things that the Minister for the Environment and actually the Climate Change Commission highlighted is that there is no specific recommendations and that is expected to come as a result of the inquiry. But we just noted that there was no acknowledgement of the need for those things. However, in this submission, we have made specific recommendations as to how those gaps should be plugged. And does this relate to the Climate Adaptation Act? Uh, correct. Through you, Mr. Chair. So the expectation is that the Select Committee inquiry would inform the contents and the mechanisms in the Climate Adaptation Act. However, as part of the change of government, there is some uncertainty around that. Um, however, we expect that as a result of the inquiry, there will be some recommendations made to the current government anyway. So they would have to act on those accordingly as, as to how they consider appropriate. And, and the issue of private capital, how do you see that working in terms of Karo or somewhere where people are having to move? You've indicated their lotteries fund, but also systems similar to energy efficiency grants. So you got any comments on that? Uh, correct. Um, for you, Mr. Chair. So the idea behind this submission point is to have in legislation mechanisms that enable uh, community to access those capitals. Currently, uh, the main funding mechanism is through uh, beneficiary pays and is mostly from action from local government. So what we're advocating for is that the system provides for those avenues. Um, now, in saying that there is a possibility that they could be used now, but if we have the right framework, then it means that councils can put that into the planning that we do in order to know which sources of funding we can leverage. So as you can remember from the discussion on the workshop on 30th of August, uh, there is some sources of funding from central government, for example, but it's very ad hoc. So what we're advocating for is that the system actually recognizes this, and we've highlighted a few examples of how this could be brought into, into the fund. And um, do you want to speculate on what chance there is of central government providing significant funds towards adaptation in our area? Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't make that call, <laughs> apologies. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Karorana. Good morning. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I, I wonder and smile about um, number seven, you know, um, community-led retreat as moving homes and businesses. What, one of the problems I see in this is the territorial um, working with us on, on where they give resource consents to build some of these places. Uh, for instance, if you remember last term, we debated around uh, Ohinawai for the reasons of where it was being built. Um, and if you go to Mokai, as you know, you know, with the peninsula moving away like it is, uh, houses falling into the water, or all of that type of stuff. So th this is, in hindsight, a good idea for now, what about the future where people are building this, these things? For instance, in, in Warren Maha's place, you know, at Thames, they're building all sorts of things there in areas that really aren't suitable. So how does this work in with all of that for the future? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, concurrently with this um, consultation, there is a consultation on the settings for a national policy statement um, for natural hazards decision making, uh, submission will be brought to council uh, to the submission subcommittee to review. Uh, so that answers the question of managing land use at the district level or uh, the resource management planning level for making those decisions and make sure that there is no risk of um, placing communities in areas where they will be at risk. So that is one mechanism. The other area that we've um, asked for in, in, in the submission is that the framework actually enables the councils to make the decisions on existing uses as well. 
uh, meaning that when we move or when we relocate, then there will be no what we call maladaptation. This is all uh, very aligned with the National Adaptation Plan. So, and, and the National Policy Statement on Natural Hazards Decision Making I just mentioned is connected to the National Adaptation Plan uh, that has three main outcomes and is reduced vulnerability to the impacts of climate change and has adaptive capacity and considered climate change in discussion at all levels and strengthen resilience. So that third leg is what you are uh, correctly referring to. So it's making sure that we don't build in the wrong places and that where we have to adapt, then the adaptive decisions increase community resilience. So we've uh, reflected that in the submission points and the answer to the questions as well. Well, uh, just what, yeah, if I can get, sorry, just, just, no, no, you're right. I'm just getting your mic. That's all. You, you know that wall that the council is taking somebody to court over because they built a retaining wall on the side of yep. the beach. That, that, for instance, if you look at the climate change around all of that, um, how do we help that particular Fano community with that wall, seeing that we are, are, are taking them to court? And they built it, I guess, without a resource consent. So all, all of this, I guess, is looking at today, tomorrow, you know, the past, the present, and the future. Um, if you, it's true, without making comment on any uh, specific matters, um, that is a, an issue that we are acutely aware of at the practitioner level, and is how to reconcile mm -hmm. the enforcement actions by council with the need to um, assist communities in being more adaptive and, and resilient. So um, there is an, a number of points in this submission that allude to that. However, it is, um, I guess, an existing tension that is likely to remain. Thank you, Ellie, Andrew. Uh, I do have a little bit of a speaking lineup, so I'll get councillors just to turn their mics off. So um, I'll have Jennifer online, then Stu, then Chris, and then Ben. So come to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Chair, and um, kia ora Alejandro. I've got three points of feedback. First of all, though, um, really good submission, a lot of detail uh, from our experiences. Our first point of feedback was that um, paragraph 19 um, about us being enablers and councils being enablers for community um, do that process really like that. If we could emphasise that more or high up, that'd be, that'd be good. I think that central government really need to hear that one. Um, the other point there around the language that you make in the first part, number one in, in table, uh, about community-focused adaptation, the importance of that language. I just feel that if central government don't get both of those points really clearly, just the terminology that they use can set us up for failure um, working with communities, and most people can figure out that um, community focused adaptation is very similar to retreat, but it does have a very different psychological impact on um, a, a lot of them that we might be engaging with. And so as another point then, um, I reflect on, which I know you know, but not everyone in this um, meeting, uh, Charles Royal gave some fe feedback at the end of the Whadakawa Coast um, Direct Working Party meeting in the uh, last one we had. Uh, and that was about being a bit more holistic about this adaptation work. Um, I just want to endorse that uh, point in general and thinking if we can tie anything like that in here. I think you kind of touch on it by talking about four well-beings um, early on, but I didn't see it in as much detail in the table afterwards. Um, and just the reason for that being that um, the psychology of moving away from something rather than the excitement that could be built in a community about moving towards something that is um, covering off the four well-beings, noting that obviously our um, way of life in the future is, is being triggered to be somewhat different from the way it has been from a multitude of different directions, um, can be tackled at once with this kind of process and it shouldn't be just too climate focused. And the last point was um, really like that you mentioned participatory budgeting um, and I just thought that perhaps in the section number 22 of the table uh, there's a potential there to mention um, 
sortition and uh, citizens assemblies and and just reference you know um, how the how the panel experiences worked for us uh, and that was that was pretty much it so those were my points of feedback for more emphasis or addition thank you jennifer uh stuart thanks um alexandra hey um tracy just a couple of things so page 40 um one of our agenda, one of the questions was um, how frequently should a risk assessment be reviewed? And I just wondered, should we have also have in there that when new information comes to light as well? Um, but I mean, I appreciate it's not a comprehensive list, but so. Yeah. Um, and the only other one was page 46, the spe specific questions about um, what, in what circumstances, if any, do you think ratepayers and taxpayers should be asked to help to pay for adaptation costs? And when, sh in the next one, when should central government help councils? I just feel like um, we should be a bit more specific around the current challenge with we and every other council in the country has got with rate bur rates burdens. It, it's because if if the government gets some sort of an idea that we're quite happy to contribute, but but don't realise. The magnitude of what that is proportional to, to what ability we have to increase rates. It's they'll, they'll get a false expectation of, of what what we're saying. And and in in terms of thirty three, we've just said oh, see answer to question thirty two. But but to me, I think we want to make some comments about the realities of what this is likely to cost. You know, um, and there's just no way in in hell that that councils are going to be able to stomach this. Hey, we we can't deal with what we've got now. You know. That was sort of my main comments. Um, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Stu. Uh, Chris. Okay. Um, just just a couple of observations. Territorial authorities don't issue consents for building on floodplains, but people still go ahead and build on them. They take the risk, assuming that it's going to be okay and they're going to be there for twenty or thirty years and they're happy about that. So they can't insure it. They're stupid. So. I don't see why taxpayers and ratepayers should be taking the underwriting, if you like, their stupidity. But I don't see anything in here which which makes comment on the fact that territorial authorities actually turn a blind eye to this activity and expect us to pick up the bill after the event. It, it, it shouldn't happen. I've personally been involved in one of these, and you, it's a personal decision whether you want to build on it or not. The councils won't stop you, but we, I don't see why any any rate payer or taxpayer should be underwriting the cost of um, placement or um, relocation if they've not if they don't have a consent in the first instance. I'd like to see that incorporated in the submission. Thank you, Chris. Uh, ben. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up a point that um, Katharina raised, which I think is similar to what Chris is saying, is that I think we should point out that where the regional council has indicated you shouldn't build there, and the territorial authority allows someone to go ahead and build, that costing for reallocation shouldn't come back to regional council. I'm concerned, as Stu is, about the costs that will mount under this system. And I'm very wary of uh, suggesting that um, we are in a capacity to pay for these things. Um, I think it's important to emphasise what we said at our September meeting, which was that there's a user pays system, and that that's the way we're liable to work uh, in conjunction with this, but that number 22, we talk about the need to clarify the division between um, district and, um, sorry, it's 22 on page 33. Uh, the lack of clarity roles between regional and territorial authorities, clear division legislation is needed. I'm just concerned that they're liable to turn around and go, well, it's a regional council function. Um, rather than territorial. So um, just more clarity about where we've declined approval and it's gone ahead with territorials, that that shouldn't be something that um, we pay for, for our ratepayers. Thank you, Ben. I have uh, Tipper, then Pam, and then Noel. So Tipper online. Kia ora, uh, Ian. Thank you for, uh, for the submission. Um, that's in front of us. Just two questions, really, Alejandro. Um, with regards to page 34 and treaty based adaptation, um, just wanting to understand why, in terms of the principles guiding 
of under 23, why Te Tiriti doesn't come in there? Is something that guides planning? Is it because it's not required, it's not our current approach? That's one question. And the other one's just a quick one. And the Tiriti-based adaptation, um, the first statement, adaptation planning needs to recognise the impacts from natural hazards and climate change disproportionately affect Māori communities. Um, by um, French, does it include whenua Māori as well, or is that something that's worth clarifying in the submission? Thank you. Um, you, Mr Chair. Um, apologies, I was looking at the reference to the second point you make. Would you mind repeating that again so that I can I can look at where it is in the submission? Um, paid under treaty to tiriti based adaptation. Yes. That the acknowledgement uh, of the disproportionate effects um, on Māori communities, and I'm just asking, does this all imply that Fenua Māori is part of that consideration as well, or is it worth noting for the purposes of the submission? If I can respond there, um, Councillor Mahuta, I think it would be worthwhile to actually reference uh, Fenua Māori in that statement as well, so it's not just the communities, but the whenua as well. Thank you. And to you, Mr Chair, to the um, first point, uh, the principles outlined in paragraph 23 were the ones that September were discussed September. by Council in the 6th of September meeting. So um, I will take direction uh, from you, Mr Chair, if you are happy for me to include um, a point to tetiriti based um, adaptation in the principles that should guide. I can just perhaps assist there. So those are the principles that came out at the workshop that we endorsed uh, through strategy and policy last time through council. Those letters to all councils highlighting those principles have been sent. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't expressly include reference, I guess, to Futility in those principles because for me it's just the way we do business and it's embedded, Councillor Mahuta. That's why it didn't get a specific reference there. But in terms, can we make the same assumption of other councils though, the other TAs that they've embedded it, embedded it in the same way with regards to adaptation work? I... Can you leave that comment with us? And I think that's definitely a, a part of the conversation that we're having and working with those other councils. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, Pamela. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, thank you, uh, Alejandro, for the submission. I think it's uh, very well written. I suppose just wanted to um, continue on that conversation around affordability and the cost of, of this, because the cost is not just in uh, the adaptation process, um, you know, the actual adaptation where where we are going to move communities should that should it come to that. It's also the cost of facilitating these conversations with our communities, because I, I just reflect on the. Um, the resources that we have committed to the conversations we're already have having, let alone the ones that will come. You know, when uh, when we think about staff costs, staff attendance time, when we think about counselors, uh, I mean, think about how many counselors are already sitting on these these adaptation um, groups already. Uh, as they continue to to um, grow and develop, then there is there's need for more bums on seats. And so I just want to make sure we're acknowledging along the lines of what you were um, bringing up, Councillor Kneebone, about the, the bigger affordability issue, there is also the affordability of even having the conversations to start with. And who is responsible for that? Is Does that sit with regional council? Does it sit with the territorial where we've got coastlines that, that um, go across uh, territorial boundaries? How is that uh, uh, facilitated? And, and also I, I, um, I'm pleased to see reference to, to fairness in this because there's the bespoke um, approach because communities want some uh, want a a uh, framework that feels 
relevant for them and their locality, but there is a need to to have uh, a sense of fairness across our region, really across our country, in how uh, we have these conversations with our community. So, um, Kota, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pamela. No. Thank you. I think the phrase caveat emptor comes to mind um, by our beware. Um, I've always advocated for uh, councils to be stronger in denying uh, the ability to build in uh, areas subject to inundation. And I go back to work at a district proposed district plan where the regional council identified uh, the flood uh, plain in the uh, basically from Narawahia through and the Waikato district put the floodplain into the district plan and has put rules in place where you cannot have habitable dwellings and if a building is erected it cannot have a concrete floor such as farm buildings on floodplains uh, and I don't know as a farmer why you'd ever want to be a building. Um, I see a person not very far from me has built one and his tractors in the lowest part of his property and the moment any water comes he's got to move the tractor so you know, um, sometimes councils have to protect people from themselves. So I absolutely support what's trying to be achieved here, but I also think the regional council has a place within its uh, regional plan that we could be more uh, and we should be looking at uh, stronger provisions to work with the TAs to prevent further development in uh, inundation areas, be it coastal or river, uh, lakes, whatever. Um, I think it's time where somebody took a stronger lead. So whilst you've got what happens when we have to retreat, you've also got to stop the actual cause of the problem uh, in its track. So it's a two-pronged attack, and I would really want to see that uh, referenced in some way. It's This cannot go in isolation without uh, equal and opposite uh, reaction by councils to stop the proliferation. Uh, and if that means coastal uh, increases in some, um, yeah, it's we've got to stop, as I say, people from themselves at times. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Noel. Um, just just one question from me, Alejandro. Um, are we indicating that we will speak to our submission at the select committee? I just note it's not on the front page of our submission. Is that something we would do? Um, do you, Mr. Chair? Yes, is something we will do. Is uh, normally in the online form, so the select committee uh, has a, a specific format that asks you that question. Okay. Yes. Um, and if I may just uh, ask a specific question for the points that were raised on building in areas of natural hazard. Uh, we did identify this during the discussion, so I'll make sure that we reflect it accordingly. Uh, one of the matters we consider is that not every time a community is in an area that is subject to risk from natural hazard has been because of um, them making the wrong decision, is just making a decision with information that they had at the time. So that's why the submission advocates um, strongly for information systems that allow us to make those decisions. So some communities actually find themselves in places of vulnerability because um, land use decisions were made when the understanding of some hazards was not as good as what we have now. So I'll make sure that the submission um, reflects that discussion among staff and the points that you've raised. Thank you, Alejandro. Are there any other questions? Yeah, well, uh, really, just a follow up to Noel's comments, which I supported. The regional council, as I understand it, does not have any authority to stop people building where they want to build. That's a territorial authority issue, and we can't do anything about that. Therefore, I don't believe we should be involved in trying to get ourselves involved now, because by default, we will then be blamed for things which happened before our, our responsibility was um, allocated to us. I don't think we should be going in that space. It's, it's the horses bolted. It's too late. Just to respond, I, I think though working with TAs to identify that they, uh, areas that they put into their district plans is, is where I'm really focusing on here. So we don't if we can't put it in our plan, and I'm, I'm not sure that we can't um, because we don't issue the building plan. That, that, I accept all that, but there are provisions that we can, I, I believe that we can look at within the regional plan that would encourage that. 
but uh, the district pla district plans dictate where they should be or shouldn't be built. And I think with the work that Waikato Region and Waikato District did to prevent that development going forward is positive and we should be working with other councils as they review their district plans um, going forward. It would achieve a, a much better outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Just really quickly, if someone, just to Chris's comment, if someone hasn't built, has built without a consent, they, they don't get insurance, do they? I wouldn't have thought. No. I thought you were suggesting that people were building without consent, but yeah, yeah, I realise that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Want... But yeah, but there won't, well, there wouldn't be. Surely, God, there's not that many people building without consent. I'd uh, come to Tracy for a comment. Yeah, um, councillors, just a number of comments in regard to this vexed issue. It, it has been an issue that has plagued, plagued. Um, our previous trainium and the trainium before that, where our council held exactly the position that you've um, communicated there, Councillor Hughes. Um, in fact, a couple of trainiums ago, it was been very clear around what our liability is and was, and where we have provided advice to councils and through Lizette and Alejandro's team, I would say at least a third of the conversations we have with our territorial authorities are focused on um, I would I would previously have said natural hazards. It's now on resilience and liability and responsiveness. So we do a lot of work in that space. We already have provisions in our roles and responsibilities under the RMA that are stated in our regional policy statement that we work through with our TAs. Um, where there are significant consents and significant plan changes, we bring them to this table. Uh, we've previously brought advice to the table and it might be useful Alejandro for us to package it up again for councillors in terms of where we have provided advice to territorial authorities on um, natural hazards exposure uh, and advice that we believe perhaps things should not go ahead whether they are in an area that is um, managed by flood structures or not because the flood structures of course I are only a level of risk. Um, and those territorial authorities choose to make a decision that um, doesn't take full cognizance of our advice, then when the liability lies. And our councillors have said for the last uh, six years, it shouldn't lay at this table. So we will um, bring that information back. It is something that we're keen on. Just listening to the conversation, there are a few um, matters that I think we'd like, we need to pull out in the submission. But what I would suggest, and we haven't seen uh, as part of the, I, I guess, the pre-election paraphernalia on the 100-day plan, um, this community-led adaptation and the funding really be a priority. So I'd suggest in the preamble to our submission, we insert it and ask that it is a priority that is examined, particularly because it is an issue that the regional sector is facing. And that clarity, the questions are, um, that you asked Councillor Dunbar-Smith, the who, the how, the what, the when and the why, we really need clarity on that as soon as possible. And it's something that I think we've shadow boxed for a number of years as a sector. Um, so I think sending that message up front uh, in our submission with a real desire that that become a priority and should we speak at the Select Committee, um, really hammering that point home, um, particularly given uh, what our region seems to go through on a high degree of regularity, and really that focus on clarifying roles and liabilities as a result of those roles, I think, is key. Um, I think picking up on the, the issue that uh, Councillor Dunbar-Smith raised around private capital and the implications of that, and what are those alternate funding sources, um, Councillor Hodge raised the issue around the future, and it's not just the year after next, it's the next five or ten years, just making sure we've identified that. Terminology um, that Councillor Nicol referred to, just making sure that we've got that right, because we know as soon as you put a word in people's minds that it becomes that word. Um, I think... The matters that Councillor Kneebone 
raised in regard to, you know, when more information comes to light, that's perhaps when the review assessments needs to be reviewed, and that's as Alejandro identified. And I guess really including something in the submission about that affordability, ability to pay the rates burden that our um, ratepayers are presently facing. Reference to whenua Māori under titiriti, and then the conversation that um, Councillor Story raised, it's not just the costs of implementation of this, but the costs of having those conversations and that investment. So those are the key matters. Um, I think a lot of that is already in the submission. It's just teasing it out and perhaps making it making it more crisp in the opening to the submission that this is really a key matter that we're looking for the government to provide some guidance on quickly. Thank you, Tracy. I think very well captured. Um, and Alejandro, I believe you've got that too. Excellent. Uh, so we'll move to the motion that's in front of us. Um, I see James has broken it into two pieces. I don't think we need to. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it as one. So if you just whip out that second one. So uh, number one is that we do receive the report, and number two, the delegation to come back to myself and Tracy, um, incorporating those comments that we've just run over. So if I have a mover and a seconder, thank you, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Dunbar Smith. Uh, all in favour? Opposed? Okay. So carried. Thank you, Alejandro. moves us on to item seven, which is page 49, the first of two that uh, relate to our coastal marine environment. And this is the submission on the Harrogate Gulf uh, Marine Protection Bill. Um, so through the Chair Council, as you'll be aware, when we were going through the coastal plan process earlier in the year to uh, have those conversations to get the coastal plan notified, there were a number of other matters swirling about. Um, the next two agenda items being top of that list. Uh, we made a decision, Council made a decision to notify the coastal plan predicated on some of this, uh, some of these discussion papers and these um, topics coming out. We we're only too mindful and we'd already received a number of, a couple of submissions to our coastal plan where people were getting confused who does what and who who has what and what documents. So I think the decision that council made in saying, hey, let, let's not go there. We're anticipating um, a proposal to come out on marine protection into Kapa Moana and also on trawl corridors. Let's leave that for powers higher than us and try not to confuse people. So I think making that decision has helped. Um, the fact that we have these two submissions together for you to have the conversation around them, I think is is a good bit of um, planning by government. I don't know if it was good planning or just fortuitous, because we were crashing towards the end of a term, so we got them at the same time. Um, but I'll leave you in, you're very familiar with JP and also with Mike, who's our team leader, um, Coastal and Marine Science. So over to you, JP. Thank yeah, you for having a presentation, James. Yeah, uh, just while the presentation is being set up to um, JP, I think one of the things that we can highlight for councillors, there are a number of us that are quite familiar in the space, but there are also a uh, number of councillors just around the um, the HPAs, S SPA, SMA concepts and um, what they involve, just so people can get their heads around what yep. that is. And I'm sure it's in your presentation. Okay, uh, Koto. Um So um, thank you for having us here today. So the Environment Select Committee is seeking feedback on the Hauraki Gulf, the Kapa Moana Marine Protection Bill. This bill seeks to address the ongoing environmental decline of the Gulf due to human activities. And it does that by proposing 19 new protection areas, increasing the marine protection areas in the Gulf from 6.7% to 18%. Um, the development of this bill um, and the marine protection areas was initiated in 2017 with the Sea Change Marine Spatial Plan. Um, flowing from sea change, government released Revitalizing the Gulf, which sought feedback on these proposed marine protection areas. WRC was a key participant on the sea change process and lodged a submission on Revitalizing the Gulf, um, supporting developing the marine protection areas. Um, so 
Um, in terms of the new protection areas, there are two new marine reserves. So these are adjacent to existing marine reserves, so they are extensions. Um, five seafloor protection areas and 12 high protection areas. Seven of these new proposed areas are within the Waikato region, being five high protection areas, one seafloor protection areas, and one marine reserve. So um, the marine reserves, they will be subject to the same rules and provisions set out in the Marine Reserves Act, um, prohibiting all fishing and extraction activities. In other words, those are no take zones. Um, HPA, so the high protection areas, they are newly, they are new proposed marine protection tool um, with the purpose to restore and enhance biodiversity. Um, while they're still allowed for customary activities, um, high protection areas prohibit a, a range of other activities, including commercial and recreational fishing and aquaculture activities. But there is a, a full list. Um, seafloor protection areas are proposed to maintain and restore benthic habitats. So, and they do that by prohibiting activities that adversely impact the seafloor and associated aquatic life. Um, around the prohibitions are bottom contact fishing methods, sand extraction and mining, but there's a few other um, activities as well. Um, in terms of the submission, uh, the proposed submission supports the bill and the new protection areas, makes suggested improvements to provisions and recommending enabling um, new protected areas to help achieve the 30% marine protection target under the United Nations Convention of Bio Biological Diversity. Submissions close today and will be up to the new government to decide on the next parliamentary business. Um, the next step will be to have the second reading and we'll potentially have an opportunity to comment on second legislation flowing um, from the bill. Um, through the chair, uh, this was the presentation I have, but uh, would you like me to de delve in more into the high protection areas and seafloor? Uh, yeah, just perhaps some comments around those high protection areas. Yep. Uh, of, of note, they are they are of uh, major concern to a number of our communities up and down that east coast, um, especially. And uh, we'll comment on that further. But um, just so councillors realise exactly what these areas are and, and the restraints put on communities by them on one half of the community and not the other half. Yes. So these high protection areas, they are similar to a marine protection area, although, I mean, they're, they're a little less restricting. Um, they prohibit, under clause 18 of the bill, they pro range, prohibit a range of activities. So I'll just go through the activities that are pro prohibited. I mean, but they are not all here as well. So those are commercial, and recreational fishing, aquaculture, large scale removal of non-living materials um, such as sand, um, the dumping or discharge of waste that will adversely affect aquatic life. Um, yeah, is there anything I um, may, I would like to defer to Chris. If, do you have any further information on that, Chris? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so that's information I have on ha in hand at the moment, unless Mike, do you have any? Um, I, I can talk very briefly in terms of the ecological uh, underpinning, as in what is in those areas, if, if that is of interest rather than political. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think councillors have enough uh, oversight. The uh, one critical item you missed out that they are still open to cultural take. Um, and 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 that is that is uh, something that's out out there in the public uh, arena, and is something that's, that that uh, we're getting a lot of feedback from. Um, so yeah, so basically, complete no take except for cultural. Yeah. All right, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, we have a few questions. I'll come to uh, Chris and then Bruce. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's interesting that you note these high protection areas are all the ideal pot spots to go fishing. Um, you take your fishermen out of there and there's going to be nothing left. And um, so, yeah, I, I certainly oppose what's being put, put in front of us. Um, in terms of if, if it's going to be closed, it should be closed to everybody. Nobody should be allowed to fish in it. 
And uh, if I'm allowed to indulge a little, Mr. Chair, I was in Fiji a few years ago, and there was a gentleman out fishing in the lagoon, and he had a thing, his hat, he was pulling a thing behind him, and he was using a throw net made of flax. Oh, as the tide went down, I went and had a chat to him, and, and he was fishing for his daughter's wedding, which was on this following Saturday, and he was allowed to fish in the lagoon, provided he used traditional fishing techniques. He wasn't allowed to use any modern equipment. It had to all be equipment that they used as a traditional fisherman in that area. If that was proposed, then I'd be very supportive of it. But as far as um, opening it up to people who have got access to all the latest gear, and because they're of certain ethnicity, they're culturally allowed to go and fish there, I'm certainly very much opposed to that. I'm happy to protect the environment, but everybody has to contribute, not just the sector of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, I'm just interested in the delineation of these areas. So because the map we've got is very broad scale. <laughs> Can you give us some clues about how, how they were actually delineated? And obviously it's mean high water, right? And um, taking a particular case there, number two, Whakaho, Swift Island. Does that delineation include the rock stacks that are sitting off the edge of the island? I mean, how how, how does this really stack up in terms of actual delineation and boundary. I'm just trying to get my head around what is actually involved here. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, I'll, I'll talk uh, um, maybe a little bit about the that, that kind of process. F firstly, a lot of these have been generated through um, through a community process as opposed to a kind of zonation or, or optimization as we might do in, from a from a scientific perspective. Uh, in terms of some of the boundaries, that's often around just the ability to, to, to manage and, and allocate rather than you know, taking a depth contour, which can be a very kind of difficult boundary to patrol or manage. So often they're done on a, on a fairly uh, you know, practical basis. Uh, in terms of uh, number two there, in terms of the, the bottom half of Slipper Island, I guess that, that would be reflecting the values which are in there, one of the remaining uh, seagrass beds within within the Waikato within the Hauraki Gulf subtitle seagrass beds, um, and so so yeah, there, there is a kind of process that that, that they go through. Yep. But, but does that and that's only the water body, right? Because the the diagram shows that over half of Waikato, a whole island. So is it the terrestrial component as well? Yeah, my my understanding is that that would be up to the the high water the the. The wet part. Yep. Right. That, that's probably just through um, through the resolution of, of that diagram. Okay, so it's just the map resolution. So in fact, it's mean high water, but that's still the issue of interesting projections and pieces which which are sort of somewhat disconnected from the main island. And I'm just wondering how this actually works in practice. I, I have seen a higher definition one that actually comes down around the islands of Penguin, Rabbit, and Rat off the off the southern end there, um, Bruce. But yeah, uh, very confusing for for the public to just look at that and go go you know how how do we assume what's inside that? Um, there is there is a breakdown of that that is floating around. So it'll be a high the high definition map for every one of these somewhere. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's all I needed to know. Um, thank you. Thank sorry, you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, through through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in in the um, in the proposed bill, there are detailed uh, coordinates and 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 those, so they they are available. Thank you. Uh, ben. Yeah, um, just a question on that uh, number 19, the customary rights. Um, it's got some regulations there. Um, in terms of customary rights, can someone from an iwi in South Waikato have customary rights fishing there, or is it only related to the iwi that are actually on the peninsula? Through you, Mr Chair, that would be a determination for a body higher than us, um, but it would commonly be those who are generally in closer proximity, but there are in fact some customary rights that are granted for some iwi who don't necessarily live adjoining the coast in some areas, and they are based on generally quite extensive uh, research and conversations that would be presented to the um, 
to the body that makes those decisions. Oh, so there is an overseeing body that makes decisions. I just wondered, does somebody monitor how how much is taken and how it's taken? So Fisheries New Zealand would be responsible. Uh, this, these are these provisions are under the Fisheries Act. So I'm not in depth familiar like with the Fisheries Act, like, but um, yeah. So there is a governing body that manages that. Because I notice clause twenty says that. Um, you're not allowed to use bottom trawling, Dana sanding or dredging, but those are quite extreme mechanisms. The rest are all available. So I just wondered what kind of take is expected from that area. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm not prepared to answer that question right now. Sorry for that. So so the, the, the customary permit um, system is set up through the Fisheries Act and and that is monitored my understanding um, talking to um, Joe Davis Nadi Hay from the area is that those permits are basically issued in triplicate um, and one one copy stays with him one goes back to the ministry uh, indicating how much was approved to be taken and what dates that was on and one stays with the fisher who must have it in their possession at, at all times um, while they're out on the water um, that information is very, very hard to get out of the ministry. Um, so yeah, that, that is a concern, but that's, that's where that regulation sits. Yeah, within Fish New Zealand. Uh, Stuart. So, so just on that one though, I, I find it hard to believe that a customary permit would enable, you know, the gross taking of undersized species and all that sort of stuff. That, that, Cause I mean, that's completely against what Nati Hay and various other areas we have been advocating for, for the Gulf. I mean. But there is no restriction. There is, they can issue a permit for undersized power, undersized crayfish, crayfish and berry. There is no fisheries regulations tied to that customary permit as such as we understand fisheries regulations from a recreational sense. Now who's we? Well, recreational fishermen. Yeah, I think we probably yep. need a little bit more than that because um, I, yeah, I understand why people are concerned about it, but that that just doesn't pass the sniff test to me. And I think we need to, if we're going to base our decision on that, I think we're making a bit of a mistake until we find out. But I, I guess from my perspective, um, putting that little issue to one side, I'm, I'm supportive of what we're doing here. We've we've all seen what's going on in the Gulf, and um, no. Um, no proposal is ever going to be perfect if we if we keep postponing doing anything because postponing doing anything because of perceived um, unfairnesses in different parts. But then then we'll effectively just give ourselves the license to keep on raping and pillaging and and, and do nothing. You know, so that that's kind of where I'm sitting. Um, to the chair, um, there's a a mechanism on the bill under clause 66 um, to provide for biodiversity objectives. And so, and that will be done through secondary legislation, and that will all, that will manage um, customary fishing. Jeppe, um, I have a, have, have a couple of points, as no doubt you can imagine. Yep. Um, I, I believe the whole of the um, bottom should be protected in the marine park. Um, so I think that's something the council should strive for. And um, if you look at a basically a specially protected area, that that rules out any um, destructive bottom fishing techniques. So if we can get that out of the park, that, that's another 12, 1,200 hectares as marine protected, that, that we're not going to be wrecking the benthic environment. Um, and I think that's something that the council should should um, push for. It's a, And it really frustrates me that they've taken the trawl corridors out of this discussion and put it into a separate discussion, which we will come to uh, later on this morning. But um, I, I think it's something, it's not going to affect um, your recreational fishing, your longline fishing and anything like that, uh, but it's going to stop those destructive bottom contact methods and get them out, out, out of the park. Um, secondly, uh, what I would like to see, which came out of the sea change document is, um, and, and for councillors, highly protected areas is a new concept. There are none in place within the existing legislation. So this is a new con concept. Um, I think council should push for specially managed areas that came out of the sea change. And that has, an, that has input from communities, iwi and science. And I think it's a far better management and it, it's far more reactive. Um, it's it's far more dynamic method. We've had a couple of examples in the Coromandel Peninsula around the scallops. 
you know, it, it was it was local community that identified that, hey, we've spoken to the ministry again and again and the scallops are being depleted. They won't take any notice of it. And it was community and iwi action that actually got a rahui put in place and then got it through legislation and got that shut off and it and it was then extended. It's given those scallops breathing space and I believe community should be involved in, in that those decisions going forward, how we manage them then hopefully when the scallops come back, um, and and have that input. Um, the other one was around the pink mau mau, and they were they were just the rape and pillage that went on in that process. Um, again, e we got involved, local e we got involved. We were able to put a rahui on, which was respected by by recreational and uh, fishers and community and iwi. And then that went to the ministry. A year later, we had them protected in the fin fish bag. So it's something I think this it's a prime opportunity for ministry to develop and be more dynamic and actually take into account all the the, the goals and um, the, the just the real um, input that community and iwi and that can have in our own you know marine backyard it's it's really important and this is the chance to do it because otherwise this legislation is going to go through we can have areas that are locked up um, with with no real ecological benefit because they're not stopping any commercial take mm -hmm. or recreational take or anything around all the boundaries of those marine reserves all around that area are, are depleted. Big, the, the snapper have gone, the crayfish are gone. Mare Island Reserve is a kinabaran and a, and a big extent of it that they're not working as marine reserves because you're not managing outside the area as well. And there's none of that in, in this proposal. Um, so that, that's where I would go. And just, just economically and wellbeing for our communities on the East Coast, so I'm using my example, um, you know, Two weeks ago, we had 10 Australian fishermen, men and women come over and they spent four days out on charters. They went. They also went to Hobbiton and and um, the, swimming, the swimming pools up in Woodyanger and stuff like that. They spend on average $4,000 each, excluding airfares and rental cars and that, in the Tairua, Woodyanger, Wongamata area. And they came over and, and they caught, between them, they caught 30 kingfish. Most of them went back. They kept a few for food and that sort of thing. And they valued those, those kingfish at $1,000 a fish compared to buying them out of a fish shop at, at maybe $100, you know, $50 a kilo, something like that. So the economic um, value of these areas around the Aldermans, around Slipper to our communities is, is just so underestimated. Um, and, and we're, as, as Chris alluded to, we're going to lose those areas basically for 10 years and possibly forever. Um, for no real ecological benefit. They're not protecting it. The fishing that's done in that area is, is generally migratory species. The, the game fish come through in the summer. You have the kingfish come through seasonally, snapper and that, and they move in and out of those areas. As I say, there's, there's less crayfish in Lee Reserve now than there was when they closed. They're snapper. There's, it's not the golden bullet, and, and we're too focused on just locking up an area and going, that'll do it, sweet. I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and happy, happy comments back here. Maybe, maybe just a couple of comments. Uh, the, the point you make about Lee and, and the, 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 the decline in, in crayfish there, one of the points that is recognised is the fact that a lot of the marine reserves are too small. So we do get, and as you describe, animals migrate out of them. Uh, a lot of people fish on the boundaries and therefore th those marine reserves have not been effective. That's one of the reasons why they're extending that marine reserve. It, it'll be one of, the, one of the reasons why an extension to the um, the Hahe Marine Reserve, the Whanganui Hay Reserve, is there. Um, there's a lot of literature that shows that the older and the larger the marine areas, the, the far more effective they are. And I presume that will have gone into the thinking around um, the the kind of deeper uh, reefs uh, and the and the size of the areas around the Alderman Islands. Uh, and, and when I say the Alderman Islands, the Alderman Islands themselves are still going to be there for the the small boat, the recreational. Fisher, um, you, you will see that those areas are, are to the north and, and to the south. This, this is being carved out between uh, between DOC and MPI. Uh, in, to, in terms of the kind of the, the no benefit, I, I have a, you know, a, a different view on that. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence around ecological spin uh, spillover. Uh, so that's where um, juveniles, the, the kind of gametes, the supply uh, held within those marine reserves, protect within those marine reserves, will go out into the wider habitat and ecosystem and, and do that. There, there is less so around the fishery spillover, so so people catching catching fish ju just on on the boundary. Um, we'll obviously talk about the 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 massive impact of commercial fishing in, 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 on the next point. 
but just recognizing that the recreational pressure is still pretty high in, in the Hauraki Gulf um, across that, you know, every, every person in their, their boat out there of a, of a weekend that, that there is a reflection that the pressures on the ecosystem are high, uh, that crayfish are functionally extinct or, 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 or under severe problems. If we look at recreational takes on things like scallops in, you know, Apito Bay, closer in than when the trawlers are, those, those numbers have still declined. So it is, it is a management of both uh, a, a recreational and, and a commercial pressures. Um, and um, as kind of previously described, it's about the, 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 the fairness and, and, and how well, it's... I, I totally agree with you, but they are fisheries management issues. You know, but they, they are not dock managed reserve issues. The, the depletion of species, and that's where, to me, it should sit. Just, just around those depletion of species and and balance and stuff like that. But just that, I do have another uh, number of speakers lining up. So um, I have Tipper online first, then Noel, then Katarina, then Stu, and then Jen. So uh, come to you, Tipper. Kia ora and, th and thank you for the report. Um, was involved uh, those years ago with Sea Change, so I understand the community conversation that was held in and around whatever they were, the, but the protection areas and the different uh, models that were promoted for the goal, again, as transitions towards um, sustainability, as I understood the theme. Um, so um, grateful for the background to the submission and that it takes us from sea change through to where we are now. Um, one question and then one ask for information. So the question is, We've got the submission with the seafloor protection areas. Wanted to know if there were any other areas identified that for whatever reason haven't been included and note that what is the impact on the next submission to do with trawling, if any. So that's one question. And the ask for information is, um, and I'm no expert, but my brother is involved in customary take and there are rules and conditions around that getting a customary take permit. So I'd rather speak to that as a formal process than um, again hearsay within the chambers. So kia ora tate. Thank you, Tipper. I believe there was a question just around those trawl corridors and how they may fit into this process. Yeah, through the chair, the, uh, the initial question is we were aware of any areas that were not included, like on the, uh, as a marine yeah. protection. Um, I was just checking with, we had some discussions with DOC, um, just mentioning that, I mean, there would be areas that would also be appropriate near the Coromandel Peninsula. It was especially around the Hawa Hau, but yeah, and those areas were not included at this stage. And this, the proposed submission um, proposed to have a mechanism on the bill where new areas can be explored and perhaps identified in the future yep. to help the 30 percent. Um, sorry, uh, there was another question around the trolling corridors. Yeah, that we'll discuss that on the next submission if, if appropriate or. It, it was just it was just, I, I guess, how how that would impact this as what we're talking to, you know, today again, as I. Um, yeah. Pointed out the the frustration of having them separated out first out of the fisheries plan and then out of out of this um, yeah. marine protection bill was really frustrating. Yeah, th these two processes were um, taking. They had a lot of consideration in one another. So the trawling corridors, they avoid on um, these marine protection areas. They were taken into consideration when establishing the trawling corridors areas. Um, the first um, step was to avoid the marine protection areas um, through this view. Thank you. Uh, no. Perhaps a question to you, uh, Warren. Um, you mentioned your preference would be to have nothing on the bottom. So is that something for the next discussion? Or um, I know there's some areas where you can't um, trawl for your scallops and that anymore. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? So can you just, because I, I'm quite happy um, have been uh, the only one and only time I've ever seen um, dredging for scallops, and, and it was horrendous on the seabed. That was for sure. So um, I'd be happy to see that excluded. And if you have to dive in the water and go down and, and push them off the bottom, that's fine. But the the wrecking of the the seafloor is um, 
is Arenda. So can you just explain, and should it be in this one, or should we discuss it next time? In the next uh, one? The, the, there is a there is a piece of that in this, and and that's the um, SPA areas where it's special protected, um, and and that is no bottom contact. Uh, no destructive bottom contact methods. Now, there are some pieces in the Gulf already, um, uh, generally around the cable zones, mm. so you can't draw or drag yeah. anything through that. Um, there is now a five more, I think it was, um, proposed uh, in, in various areas to try and, and protect that um, benthic environment. Um, to me, we should be protecting the whole marine park as that and just say, and which comes into the trawl corridors um, because they haven't given us, to me, an option zero. In other words, none at all. Um, so, it, yeah, I, I think for me, regional council should push to have those methods. And it's only method. It's it's not commercial fishing. It's just method. That's the bottom destructive method. As you said, what the dredges do, what the bottom trawling does with its gates and chains and ticklers and rollers, and then what the Danish seining does with its trawl lines and stuff like that. Yeah. They just drag right across the bottom and clean it out. Yeah, so um, I, I, it's I pretty... support you in, in what that, you know, the direction you wanted to go, um, because you know, having seen it firsthand, I, I was absolutely appalled and um, probably like eating scallops, although yep. Uh, yep. not entirely because I just love them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if that can be incorporated with some, some further support, I'd be happy. Thank, um, thank you. Thank you. And, and, again, and again, it is that you, you've also got that resuspension of sediment and everything that that, that happens within the, within those processes. Um, you know. And, and so how long does it take for the sea floor to recover after it being dredged? I, I wouldn't have that answer, but yeah, but you know, like, but when you clean everything off, it I'm we, imagining we've got to think more long term and, and for perpetuity for our your grandchildren and, and beyond. To have and, and and this is why this is the perfect time to do it. This is the first time that this has been looked at. This is an ongoing process, as Tipper mentioned, being involved in that sea change process. You know, that was six years before 2016, 2017, when it was notified and sent to central government. So this is an ongoing process. Um, those groups included everybody. That so there was recreational, there was commercial, there was landowners, councils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everybody was involved, and they came up with 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 a solution package. And unfortunately, here we are, what ten years down the track, virtually still trying to get something um, put into it. Yeah, um, Katarina. Oh, okay, um, Stuart. Thanks, Warren. Hey, I'm just trying to work out where we're going with this. Can, can I just ask you respectfully, as both as chair and as a keen fisherman, um, wh where you're heading on this submission? First, so that's part of my question. Okay, so so what I would like to see is is in our submission that um, we we push for a, a different type of protection around those highly protected areas, which involve community, iwi and science um, as, a, as a concept and framework, um, and then also looking at the, um, the specially protected area, which is the bottom non-contact, that we actually push for the whole of the park. Okay. So, so I guess where I'm going generally is, are, are you saying let's let's add to this what we've got here, or are you wanting to buff it out and start again? No, no, but basically add to... Oh, that, that's, uh, that's fine, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you've just given us quite a comprehensive brain dump uh, yes, of a bunch yeah, of stuff, and, yeah. and I'm just not intimately engaged in this to know. So, no, that, that's, that's fine, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, no, and no. recognising that this submission is due today by yeah, yeah, midnight. Yeah. Okay, no, yeah. that's cool. So we're on the track to, to so, get something constructive going yeah. on yet. No, thank sorry, you. Uh, sorry, I've got Jen online and and then Robbie. No, oh, thanks, Jen. Just uh, as your alternate to the Hauraki Golf Forum and everything I'm exposed to there and have seen. Yeah, Jen, can you just speak up? Also, it's very quiet in the chamber. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, as your alternate on the Hauraki Golf Forum, I've obviously been exposed to what the state is in. Um, uh, in short form, it's dying. Uh, so the time is now completely second what you say, uh, be because ultimately, yeah, it's, it's too distressing that there will be things gone forever than um, to not take a bit of a more of a precautionary approach here for a few years and for that to be community led uh, would be amazing of course because people who see it every day intimately involved and um, subsidiarity of that kind of driving and decision making uh, would be a step in the right direction for how we do things thanks um so you're saying no private dredging either of uh, scallops 
So I've done that in the past myself. And there's most probably about four species or five species you drag up with the scallops. So yeah, I totally agree. What we used to do get away with 20 odd years ago was um, quite amazing. Um, I, are you saying that no bottom dredging on all of the blue area? Is that what you're saying in the map? Uh, I haven't got the map in front but of me, but that, that map there, all of the blue. Correct. The, for the, that, the blue area indicates the whole of the Hariki Off Marine yep. Park. So, so no bottom dredging or or um, um, yep, seining or trawling. Yep. 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 Correct. Or both recreational and commercial. Yep. Which yes. I would support um, as well. Um, same as Noel. Uh, yeah, as I said, I can remember going up into the Coromandel was 21, going scalloping, thinking we were smart, dredging for an hour and a half, and came out with a, a human amount of scallops and shared them with our friends and thought we were doing good things. But, yeah, now now others can't even share it in that now. So totally support what you're saying. Um, and I totally agree that unless there's going to be – you're going to get outcomes from – Protecting these areas, or, or we're not. We got to know what the outcomes and what the benefits going to be if we're going to protect them. Because there's no use locking it down as if, if there isn't going to be an outcome from it. So I, I really struggle that you're knocking and you're not telling us what's going to be the outcome for protecting it, and you should be able to give us that information. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, but I definitely no no bottom trawling by by um, licensed or public. Yeah, or however you want to explain it. Mm. And just around that comment, Robbie, um, I understand the spillover effect and that sort of thing. Um, where I would contest it is uh, I, I don't think those organisms in those areas particularly are in danger at the moment. It's, it would be the angle that I come from. Um, the, the, the fishing and, and the recreational pressure and, and even commercial, they commercial long line out in those two areas. Um, they used to gill net. Thank Christ they've stopped that. Um, but, yeah, the, the, that... Benthnic area and, and that area around that isn't isn't being affected by um, human interference at the moment. Uh, ben, yeah, uh, two things. One, um, I don't have much expertise in this area. I acknowledge that you do, so I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. Um, at the moment, in uh, number four in our actual submission on page 56, we're basically supporting everything. We're supporting the bill, supporting the protection areas, commending the approach to customary rights. So at the moment, if we vote, we're actually voting for everything that is currently there. If you've got amendments to make, do you want to propose some? Secondly, to Tracy, is um, is there a way of getting a, an extension on our submission so we don't have to have it in by midnight tonight? So the um Government and the people who run these things down in Wellington are pretty clear in terms of the select committee what their dates are. However, in the past, what we have done is lodged our draft submission, noting it is subject to changes, and then we have asked that, um, you know, the changes generally are not a wholesale rewrite of the submission, nor would they be in this instant, but um, we we ask and we are, have been able in the past to reload to our submission, noting that these submissions, our preference is always to have councillor input. Um, JP is only too aware that the submission closes today and has his pen at the ready once he's finished presenting another item or two um, to actually make any changes so that we would be hopeful that we'd be able to lodge something by five o'clock. Again, under the delegation of the chair and myself, having heard the conversation at the table. I'm still not clear on who identified the HPAs. Uh, who, in other words, listening to your proposal, Warren, you're essentially saying we don't want any seafloor um, trawling, and I'm sure we can all agree with that, but you're also saying you want to reject the APA. HPAs. So who's who are we rejecting when we reject the HPAs? Well, um, 
This all comes from the Sea Change Marine Spatial Plan and revitalizing the Gulf, and that's throughout the Department of Conservation. So that's. I'll give Tracy to give you some comments around. Oh, sorry. I'll give Tracy to give you some comments around the Sea Change process. Um, which then went down to government um, and, and just noting that these HPAs weren't in that original um, document that was then presented, but Tracy lived it, so. So, councillors, the sea change process was uh, something that we, we co-ran with the Auckland Council, co-facilitated, I guess. Um, uh, Councillor Mahuta was our uh, representative on it, and prior to that, uh, Councillor Timothy Bramley and Councillor Peter Buckley. So it was a process that ran, it was fairly intensive, uh, running at the same time, I might add, as Plan Change 1 collaborative processes. So nearly every second week there was either a, a collaborative process here or in Auckland. Um, we had many meetings. Uh, the meetings were, as um, Councillor Maher has said, there were about 30 representatives in the core group, augmented by about another 40 to 70 in each of the working groups, representations across the board from all the usual suspects you would anticipate, um, as well as some specific uh, interest groups who have recognition in, in the um, Te Kapa Moana. So that was about a three year process. Some pretty, I have to say, um, and Councillor Mahuta will. Um, have your own reflections, but some pretty hard conversations um, between commercial recreational fishers, uh, aquaculturalists and environmental defence society who were very present. Um, where we ended in the where we ended up with the sea change was a marine spatial plan. There was an undertaking at the end of the process that each of the key agencies for implementation being ourselves, Auckland Councils, uh, territorial authorities and each of the ministries would then pick up that document and develop an implementation plan. We were the first agency who developed an implementation plan to feed into our long-term plans around what was business as usual, what could we pivot or change as business as usual and what was going to require additional investment. Um, Auckland Council used that as their basis. And then we waited, as uh, the chair has said, for some time for the ministries uh, to decide how they were going to knit things together from a Wellington perspective, particularly Department of Conservation, MPI and Ministry of Fisheries. So these proposals have come out some time later. Um, they are not, uh, as JP has indicated, they are not a, a direct replication of sea change and each of the agencies at the table said, look, whilst 30 odd people are coming together, we still have to go back to our respective masters who will make the decision. So in regard to the highly protected areas, they are a construct that has been, and JP, please correct me if I've got this wrong, but they are a, a construct that has come out as a way to respond to sea change through the Department of Conservation. Yes. So I hope that it helps their kind of fucker papa and who they are. Yeah. Yeah, that does help because that should have been spat out really early on in this discussion, I have to say. I'm pretty concerned about where we've landed now because what we're discussing now is rejecting an application from a government agency that has a significant role in this process. And um, whether we, I mean, I'm sort of sitting here somewhat similar to what Stu was in, in terms of my comment. I haven't been a particularly close follower of the whole process coming to this today, you know, trying to get up to speed as quickly as possible. But I'd be extremely concerned if we just outright rejected something like this, because I think the way we frame our submission is going to be critical here for our ongoing dialogue with all of the key parties. And um, so I'm just the way it's been explained to us by the due respect to our chair, the way it's been explained to us is, is as an out and out rejection. And I'm really uncomfortable with that. 
So um, I'm just wondering if you can, because the consequence of that would be essentially the a core component of the submission. Um, well, first of all, the submission in front of us supports HPAs, right? Massively supports them. And then we have a completely contradictory suggestion coming in at this late point. And the, and the question I'm trying to get my head around is, yeah, what are the consequences of a submission which at this late stage suddenly goes to the opposite side? Yeah. Uh, just uh, coming back to that, Bruce, um, it, it, it's not a it's it's not as black and white in that. What I'm suggesting is that we look at a specially managed area in replace of a highly protected area, and that special management still has biodiversity at it, at its hub. It it's still, but what it does involve it allows community and and iwi and science to have an input in that process. Um, identify and and believe you me, um, it's it's the it's the boaties and the divers that are out in those areas that notice these things first. You know they're the ones that have picked up Kalerpa. They're the ones that see the crayfish heading for functionally extinct and the and the and the lack of snapper etc cetera, etc. Cetera, the seabirds, everything. It's actually it's actually those fishermen, um, be, be they be they iwi or or recreational that are on the water that actually see those things. So what I'm as hoping as we could get to is that there is there is another framework. It's called a special managed area. It's, it came through the sea change process. Um, our submission does um, speak to it. Uh, also, the Harriki Gulf uh, Forum supports that type of management for these types of areas. So it's not a black and white, let's just wipe that out and just and status quo. This is a, an alternative management structure for those areas. We're still with the key outcomes that we're looking for in, in improving, protecting and improving that biodiversity um, right across the spectrum. So, so please have confidence that, that I'm not just ruling it out. And I also want to bring in just the economic value for these areas for our communities. Um, and, and that, which is a piece I think that sort of is, is only very lightly touched on. Yeah. So, but, but cer certainly those key outcomes are, to me are the same, just okay. a different management tool. To okay. Get there. okay, I understand that, but so the extent of change that would have to occur to the submission because it's due today is quite significant. You're going to you have to articulate an alternative. You can't just say no. You've got to actually have some solution. Yeah. And so um, I'm interested in comments from the staff about what could be done to provide that solution in the submission, right? Um, and I'm also still interested in knowing what the consequence might be for the other partners who've been involved in this process, not just Doc. So, uh, other, do we have any intelligence about other submitters who are likely going to take a similar approach to what our chair is advocating? Uh, but just on that, as I, as I say, the Haraki Gulf um, Forum has has submitted in a very similar way. Um, that's that's publicly available, um, and as you're aware, there's something I sit on. Um, there are another. The Harriet Gough Alliance has has submitted in a very similar way. Um, so, and and again, that special management, the Ahu Moana concept, has come out of the sea change process. So it's not it's not something foreign uh, to those agencies. Um, it, it's 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 been out there. Um, there is not a lot of framework around it. It's still a discussion. Type thing, but to me, those are examples I mentioned around the scallops and the and the pink mau mau are, are samples of how that particular process could could work. So in ter uh, terms of comment about the what would oh, sorry, what could be done for the mission staff side yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um. Yes, and I'm just thinking as well as I'm speaking through you, Mr Chair, so bear with me, I'm just trying to hatch a plan as well as respond to the question. So for me, I think the the submission is supportive of the HPAs purposefully because that is the instrument that's put out there. So as an instrument for protection, we've said yes, because at the moment there is nothing. Mm -hmm. So we have said yes, we agree with the principle, we definitely need protection. I think from what I'm hearing is we agree with the why, we're not so sure about the what. Um, what I heard, what I think I heard, and please um, 
clarify for me that what we would we are definitely after something that um, is looking to protect this important area. We are after something that perhaps is not quite so blunt and is a bit more flexible and responsive. We have a demonstrated track record of using an instrument such as that, even though we've managed to work through a process that doesn't have a particular name. We can give examples of where it has worked. Um, it, it is something that would adhere closer to the sea change document that this council has in fact endorsed and has it its own implementation plan. Um, I, I was going to suggest that we didn't say completely, uh, council's not saying completely throw out the HPAs, but we need to go back and consider, consider a more nuanced tool, which we believe is already provided for by way of the special management areas and sea change. That's what I was going to say. Could we capture that by way of changing that narrative and the submission to make allowance for that process that we know is a proven process? It's focused on the right outcomes. Might just be a different way of getting there. That's that's what I had in my mind. The conversation and the point around the um, uh, non-destructive bottom contact, well, sorry, the destructive bottom non-contact, yeah. sorry, that word, yeah. the the dredging for the entire Te Kapa Moana is a bit more black and white, yeah. but it's the nuance because it's the interests of people that we're trying to incorporate. Sorry, Mike, did I get that? Uh, yeah, and on the interest of people, may, maybe Chris State, in terms of the feedback that we received on, on the coastal plan around that, in terms of both those who are pro-fishing, but then also those who are pro-protection in terms of uh, the, the, the feedback received on the plan? Sorry, I'm not across it. Oh, no, no Chris, is, Chris is gonna give us a comment, that's all. Uh, just while we're getting a microphone too, um, one thing that had slipped my mind is um, Nati Hay currently have an application or an Ahupokana principal process around the Alderman Islands. Um, so obviously something that locally we are supportive of too. You got a, you got a microphone? I'll give it a Yeah, yep, thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and I've got to say, yes, the fact that we have a proposed regional coastal plan, Department of Artified, Department of Conservation with Marine Protected Areas, and a fisheries plan um, from MPI out at the moment is confusing an awful lot of people. Um, in the coastal plan, we're, I'll say we're up to 10 submissions now, but the first six we got were all either on the dock uh, marine protected areas, um, which concerned what people could or couldn't do around our, our Slipper Island. Um, we've had quite a lot on um, that we were, should restrict, yeah, well, saying that we should not restrict um, recreational fishing in the coastal plan, which we are not doing. And um, in discussions, um, discussions around the content of the coastal plan with um, with in, with well various parties such as EWI, EDS, and um, f uh, Fishery um, MPI. Um, yes, I know that. Well, those on the those on the more environmental side of the spectrum want to see. All, com all commercial fishing banned from the Hauraki Gulf and recreational fishing limited. And I know MPI, um, they do not want a repeat of the Motiti um, decision. Motiti process here, mainly due to the complexity and expense, they'd like it sorted out through um, without going all the way through the courts. Um, yeah, all the coastal plan, the marine protected areas, and the fisheries plan, they all have their own role in what they are trying to do. And one of the things that we are going to do with hopefully submissions on the coastal plan will allow us to do is make sure the coastal plan covers gaps and doesn't overlap with uh, these other two instruments um, majorly. 
Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. I think you've captured that well. It is a very complicated space and um, I would congratulate the team on, on where we got with our coastal plan and, and, and not um, looking to override and complicate it even more in some of those areas. Uh, I've got Robbie up next. Thank you, Mr Chair. So are we going to discuss, it, would, is there any discussion in catch take or not? Uh, again, no, no. no. For, for, that's a that's a that's a fisheries thing. So anything to the QMS and recreational take but commercial that, that, case take and I, I know it's just it seems counterproductive, but that's just the way it is. Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll just go back to just go back to COVID and I'll, just a discussion just for a second. Let's go back to COVID and I have I haven't actually been fishing since COVID. Tell you the truth, and all my mates that went out said they had the most amazing fishing for that those months afterwards that no one was out that was unbelievable and so the issue here is actually numbers catched the, the, yeah. <laughs> I just can't believe we're not even talking about that no, not our gig no, thanks um Stu that oh we I've got you down on speaking no Okay. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a bit confused about where we're going here. I just in that we're trying to, there was some big stuff in a really short space of time, no. and it would have been really helpful if it could have been socialised. It, it, I, I mean, yeah, I, I did, I did impress chair, on staff to get it out two weeks early, and I know, I know it is. Uh, yeah, I, I'm talking and, about you coming to us as chair saying, hey, I've got a whole bunch of changes I want to make here before okay. jumping on us right now. What, <laughs> I'm taken. Uh, Jennifer online. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to suggest earlier on that, you know, we have a strong preference for one method, but, you know, the fallback of what's proposed. But otherwise, yeah, I think we're starting to resolve things, so I'll leave it there. Okay, I have Chris, then Ben, then Tipper. Chris. Yeah, um, look, Mr Chair, I'd just like to support what you're saying, where you're going on this. Um, these HPAs take no recognition of the pelagic nature of fish, the migratory species. And just by mapping something on there, it's not going to achieve the outcomes that are required. It needs science. Science-based solutions is the only way to go on this. Otherwise, you'll end up with the continuing disaster that we've got at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Ben? Yeah, basically where we're at is um, signing off on item four on page 56. So we, we're saying we support the bill, we support the new protection areas. Uh, we commend the uh, customary rights, recommend a mechanism for a new protecting areas for helping the diversity, suggestions for improvements, and then item F, recommends that the bill should provide for special management areas. Now, that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Correct. Yep. So that allows us to approve this and then have supplementary information on what the special management areas are. Could be a two-page paper that goes down with this document because it's sitting there as item F. I think referencing it back um, to to those discussions around that Ahu Moana concept that came out of sea change and that sort of thing that that information is already there in screed so um, and it and it is in a number of um, other submissions I know are coming to this so I, I think there is enough information there to to sit with that point as you make. So basically, what is it you're asking us for? If we approve those four, five, and six, seven points with F included. Does that cover what it is you wish? Um, sorry, Mr. Chair. Th thanks for taking us back to those because I think it's really useful. What what I'm hearing is uh, nothing actually changes in A through to F, but additional narrative to support the use of the special management areas and requesting that um, there might be a bit more nuance in the tools used as opposed to the blunt instrument of the highly protected area. areas being just a one size fits all approach. Yeah, so whether whether we alter the supports the new protection areas, we support the principle of the new protection areas. I mean, are we going to advocate for new protection areas and then talk about the special management areas or are we so my advice my advice would be that we support the protection areas. So as a principle, we're supporting additional protection. Nobody has said they don't support that. 
it's just the how. And so, and if we're recommending the bill should provide for special management areas and that it be a, and again, thinking while talking, uh, that it be a, perhaps an option of a highly protected area or a special management area as to the tool, how we get to the outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it's just we need to, if we're going to vote on this, it's that bit mm -hmm. that we're voting on. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Uh, Tipper. Um, Kia Tracy, just to pick up on the last point you made um, and then around the gains from seed change, we're process gains too, so how can we focus in that solution part that you're on, on um, community-centred decision-making? I think that's what I hear um, the test talking into, but again, that, that's one point. Uh, the other one, and it's just for process and, and, and support and protection of our chair, um, obviously, you have a registered interest in the MET. I just want to make sure we're making the decisions with your interests in mind, but also protecting you, Kilda. If I could get some guidance from governance on that, Yamahi. Thank you, Tipper. Governance question. So, in respect to any interest, that's up to to you yourself to declare um, as part of any um, discussion. Uh, yeah. James, I'd be looking to you for guidance in that regard, part of the business. Uh, the, I've, I've declared um, who I, uh, what, what organisations I sit on and that right at the beginning, so I believe that's taken care of. Yeah, so Mike, sorry. Through you, through you Mr Chair, yeah. just, just a few comments and, and kind of points yeah. let me raise. Um, just to address a few of those, um, just making the point that not all fish are migratory. We, we have pelagic fish. There's a lot of cryptic species, invertebrates, uh, fish with narrow, pelagic fish with narrow ranges and, and more benthic focused fish. So, so the kind of the point that these um, protection areas are not going to achieve anything or the point of them, I think, I think there's a lot of uh, discussion around that. Um, and it often comes down to which, which species we're talking about. That is kind of their point is, is kind of broad protection of biodiversity in which a whole range of physical activities cannot occur so so when we're not this is not being done to manage fisheries this is being done to protect the Waikato biodiversity um, in terms of uh, physical disturbances just to make a quick nod that there is a report on our website around physical disturbances around fishing impacts which kind of relates to this is, is in the submission uh, and, and just have a look at that um, and that the, the uh, just, just to be clear, there are quite a lot of ecological benefits uh, to to uh, protection areas. Uh, to the point Councillor Nickel made around uh, being on a knife edge, just to toe toku that, um, making the point that the Tasman scallop fishery is still collapsed uh, through the removal of, of uh, largely thought to be around the removal of bi biogenic material from those big destructive fishing methods. Um, and the action is needed sooner rather than later to protect it. So debating around whether or not this is needed, a bill that might be signed off within a year, when Ahu Moana actually becomes uh, operational, how long that process takes. J just to make the point that these are not mutually exclusive, you can have protected areas in addition to having um, Ahu Moana, um, and that we're talking about protection going to 18%. That's, this is not 82% closed. This is 82% open with, uh, with with the proposed protection there. Uh, but yeah, the, the main point being, there is a lot of evidence around the, the benefits of, of protection. I, I guess just to bring it to home for, for us, uh, some of the surveying, some of the work that we have commissioned. So for example, uh, Kinabarans, which you'll, you'll be aware of um, in, in the Whanganui Hay, uh, Marine Reserve, uh, again, the, the fishing uh, fishing pressure and the various pressures on, on our coast uh, in the Whanganui Hay uh, uh, Marine Reserve, Kinabaran is 5%. In the immediate area outside of that, uh, 20%. So, so there, there are, we do have clear evidence of the benefits of protection of that reef structure of the associated species with that uh, through, through this mechanism. So. Thank, thank you. Uh, ben. Oh, uh, two things. One, obviously, um, one option for you is to abstain on any vote. If you wish to do. 
Um, but I just wanted to clarify with Tracy that this page 56, those those seven points there, is that what essentially we're moving forward on? Because there seems to be no need to change those if the special management area had so presumably progressed. Any comments, Tracy? Uh, yes, as I say, there's not a wholesale rewrite of the submission required, more an expansion of a couple of those points, particularly if and particularly uh, the methods that are used to achieve B. Uh, Councillor Clarkson. Yeah, well, I'm, I must say I'm actually very concerned now because we're getting conflicting information from our staff and that information is essentially discussing the fact that some of this decision making is actually based on science. So it's up against the comments, for example, that Hughes made about migratory flight. So um, and looking at the submission, the line in there that says the council supports establishing 12 highly protected areas. So I'm assuming that means that the staff believe that that should be the case. And so we, we have a really significant disjunct going on now in, in this process. And to happen now at such short notice, I mean, I'm speaking as a councillor, I wasn't, I, there's been no heads up on this to me, and I suspect to others as well. So I'm really concerned about what we would actually now be voting on in the sense that I'm not I'm not inclined to support the concept that this would be delegated because the situation we're into now is, I'm sorry, Warren, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. We, we have got into a scenario where we would then be passing it back to you. You've got a particular view on this, which appears to at least partially conflict with what the staff are saying. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty concerned about some of this. But Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to Noel. Uh, thank you. Look, um, I think to predict yourself and to predict council, I'm prepared to move, but substituting your name for the deputy chair, and I believe, believe that's true. And I think it would protect you and it would protect the council um, just to be transparent and a little bit of arm's length for you. Um, yeah, I, in all honesty. Um, so uh, if you're prepared to take a motion, I'm prepared to test this because we've had a, quite a bit of time on it. Uh, and I'd move uh, the recommendation up there, uh, substituting uh, committee chair to deputy chair. And it is you, isn't it, Sue? Yeah, I would support that. So I'm just trying to get an understanding of the process now. That would mean Tracy and I would sit down this afternoon and agree on what the final draft is. So I'm out from about three. So, um, first of all, Council, I do just want to highlight this is a tricky matter. Um, and so was fully anticipating a pretty robust discussion and that's why we got this out in advance. It's a matter that's, um, you know, we haven't seen it for a while out of central government because of its trickiness. Um, so the normal process that we run is if there are amendments to submissions, then um, we'll either schedule a time if we've got the time, um, generally within a couple of days of the, the meeting, or uh, like this one, we have done it before, where we've done it the day of. Uh, there were a couple last triennium where we've sat down at the conclusion of the meeting and gone through it. Um, uh, we haven't had an instance where We've had to uh, do that with the deputy chair as opposed to the chair. I had just written down here whether it is the chair and the deputy chair and myself. I will um, say to council, I my previous advice to the previous two trainiums of council will still stand. I do not believe that uh, the submission gets sent out to all councillors and then we have an email spider web of responses and non-responses because that is, is not helpful. So the process would be uh, wherever council lands, we would, once we've finished uh, our business of today, 
staff would sit down. We'd almost, um, as we've done before uh, with Councillor Story and Councillor Nicol, we had the document up on screen and went through and did it there and then so we could lodge it. Yes, and that worked very well. Um, two or even three people worked really well. Um, yeah, th thank you, Tracy. Um, th just just from from my point of view, um, I'm happy to, get to to go along with that that suggestion. Um, I, my understanding was that councillors would be um, that that the the SMA um, conversation it wasn't a foreign concept. Um, that, that it is it is in basically um, our. our Stuff documents and that sort of thing. So um, I didn't. I didn't believe I was bringing anything new really to the table. Just a just a possibility of looking at um, basically reclassifying an area that would be in indicated as an HPA to to more a SMA. And my reasons of thinking uh, behind that, with with community involvement, etc., the economics for communities and that sort of thing. So that's that's where I was sitting. Um, certainly, like. To think that you have the confidence that uh, basically I wouldn't throw anything in there behind your back that hasn't been discussed, um, and I generally base this stuff on on notes that Tracy and I have taken on discussion that's happened within the chamber. Um, so I wouldn't introduce any new material or any other any other things, or try and influence um, what what the general feeling around and the comments that have come back to us. Uh, but um, we have a motion there. Just just one. Um, I think the point here, Warren, is that you have thrown a whole bunch of stuff that has got conflict with what staff have said, but we've got it at the 11th hour. Yep. And as chair, you kind of need to, if you've got that strong of views on things, you kind of got to bring it to us a bit earlier because we just can't, as, as individuals that aren't involved in the same depth to this discussion as you are, it's gone. Appreciate that. You know? Mr. Chair, can I, with respect, I'd like to know. Um, hear from the staff on their experience actually fishing in these HPAs. How many of them have actually been there and fished them? The chair, I have never fished there. Um, so fish, fishing in the specific uh, HPAs, uh, no, I have not fished there. I've been diving in the Alderman yeah, Island. That's all I want to know. Okay. Thank you. I'd yeah. like to seek a seconder for the motion, please. Yeah, I'd like we, to hear the last comment that we didn't get then because it was cut off. Could we could we he hear your answer, please? Uh, yep. So I, I haven't been fishing there, but I have been diving around the Alderman Islands, uh, shallow waters down to about 40 metres or so, uh, seeing the reef systems there and the health there. Um, I, I, I guess in terms of whether or not I've been fishing, um, as kind of mentioned, I don't really think that's relevant. What is relevant is me seeing the species and the biodiversity in, in, in this context. Um, and also, I'm just one person, so that's also irrelevant from, from the perspective of uh, this decision being made for the Waikato population. Again, that, thanks for that honest opinion. Um, I was diving there last weekend. Again, um, you know, pers personal opinion ar around that. Um, what I like to think is that I actually echo comments um, and concerns that my constituents have brought to me, um, and and that's really that's really important from my point of view and representing my communities. So, oh, sorry, Ben. You have, yeah, I'd like to um, second the motion, um, and I recommend that we do the number two deputy chair and that he's effectively looking at uh, expanding on what the SMAs are, which is 10 at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Nope. And so nobody's talking. I, I I don't agree. I, I, I don't have a problem with Warren, Stu and Tracy being the delegates or the three people looking at that. Why Warren? Is because, yep, the kururu he's brought to the table, we don't know about it but today, but he may be able to add to the submission. Uh, why Stu? Is because he doesn't know about what Warren has to talk about and you can make sure the other stuff is all there. Why Tracy? It's because Tracy is the overall director of order. So from my perspective, I have nothing wrong with the chair staying in there with Stu and Tracy to go over the last papers. 
I'm could, well, could, I'd talking. just like to take a uh, just a basically a five minute yeah uh, break just uh, just outside the recording and that and uh, yeah just to come back I think a little bit better informed. Uh, yeah, let's make it ten, just so you can get a cup of coffee and have a discussion.